great. Oh, wonderful. Thanks, Marin. You're too kind, as always. A brilliant introduction to, our, to the centre. Um, so, uh, as you all know, there's been a lot of pop science arguing that attention has been so degraded by engaging with the wiki-wacky world of digital that we're creating a generation of ADHD in our young people. Now today I'm going to put forward the opposite hypothesis, or an opposite hypothesis, which is that actually the digital world is an antidote to ADHD, because actually it, it cuts with the grain of ADHD people's attentional style um, and allows them to operate on a level playing field with so-called neurotypical people. Uh, oh, those are my... It's a bad habit from uh, scientific meetings. Those are my disclosures. Um, um, and today's talk, I've got three bits I'm going to do. First of all, I'm going to do a 101 on what is ADHD, very quickly. Secondly, I'm going to highlight how it's a contested concept and how it's become more... Con Am I... Can I go in the middle? How it's become more contested um, with the rise... Um, of the so-called neuro, neurodiversity perspective competing with the classical medical disorder perspective on ADHD. And then finally, I'm going to get on to addressing the actual question of whether the digital world can actually can uh, support people with ADHD and is there kind of natural environment. They've been looking for this environment and now it's there. We'll see. So, okay, what is ADHD? Very quickly, First of all, it's diagnosed on the basis of a, a cluster of three uh, behaviours. Uh, hyperactivity, oh yes, going on there, inattention, and impulsivity. So those are the kind of cardinal features of ADHD. And they cluster together within the population, uh, creating people, uh, not creating people, uh, um, leading to some people having a clinically impairing condition in the middle there. It has to be worse than expected for age. It has to be persistent and pervasive. It has to have a childhood onset before the age of 12 now. It used to be before the age of seven, but they've gone to before the age of 12. And it's got to interfere with functioning in normal environments, in typical environments. And that becomes quite important with regard to this talk. So what is a typical environment? Is the internet a typical environment? Things we've learned about ADHD in terms of research uh, very quickly are that although it's distinct in some ways from other neurodevelopmental and mental health conditions, there's massive overlap, say with autism, with depression, with conduct uh, difficulties. That it's incredibly heterogeneous at multiple, at multiple, sorry, at multiple levels, um, both at the expression of the symptoms uh, but also uh, in terms of underlying causes. So different people who have ADHD are very different uh, in themselves, but also in their behavior, sorry, in their behavior. It's probably actually the extreme of a dimension and not a distinct category of people. So you could say to different degrees, we've all got a bit of ADHD. It does create a burden across the lifespan that escalates as people grow and leads to some really bad outcomes if it's not treated or if it doesn't remit spontaneously. So like substance abuse, difficulty holding down a job, uh, relationship problems. And of course it's more common in blokes. So, what about the issue of how we should think about ADHD? So the standard view of course is that it's a, a medical disorder or a disease even. But it remains a controversial and contested uh, concept, both in terms of how we should view it and also in terms of how it should be treated. And this has become more acute with the rise of the neurodiversity perspective, which I'll talk about. So as humans, we're amazing. We can look at exactly the same stimulus and we can see two very different, this is a classic one. Anybody who's done psychology will have done this optical illusion. So what do you see when you look at that? Do you see a beauty or do you see, um, well, I called it a haggit. That's what they called it originally. It's an old one. The beauty, of course, has got the feather in her hair. The hagger's got a big nose here. 
which you see. And if you see one of them, you, can't, you just can't make yourself see the other. It's fascinating. Same for ADHD. Do you see a disorder or do you see divergence and difference? So the standard view was it's a disorder. So if you see it as a disorder, what does that really mean? Well, it means basically you're buying into a, what we call in science a paradigm uh, about what causes ADHD. And ADHD is caused by dysfunction within the brains of individuals who have ADHD. And that is intrinsically linked to the fact they, that they, they're impaired in their actions in the world. So that's the disorder perspective. And that, of course, has consequences in terms of people's lives. So that's the model. Clinically, of course, what you want to try and reduce is the impairment and improve the long-term outcomes. So what do you do? From this model, of course, you target the individual, try and change their brain to fix the impairment. And that's the medical model. That could, of course, be done by pharmacological means. It's quite common in ADHD. Uh, so Ritalin is a is a term everybody knows, but there's quite, a, there's quite a range of drugs that you can take now. But other things like cognitive training, working memory training, tension training might be effective. The role of science then, what we've been doing for 30 years, probably completely wild goose chase, is say what bit of the brain has gone wrong in, these, in people with ADHD. So we can find it and fix it. So that's that kind of paradigm. Of course, um, what's come along is a neurodiversity paradigm. And the neurodiversity paradigm really comes out of the autism community. And it's a rights-based paradigm. It's got much more in common with the rhetoric of human rights um, uh, rather than medis medical science. But clearly it's got implications for science too. And so, well, I can't say. So first of all, it reframes ADHD. Basically says it's uh, a natural part of natural variation of brain structure and function and uh, that leads to uh, a range of different attentional styles. It's not saying it's disorder, it's variation. Crucially, that breaks the link between the child, their brain, and so-called impairment, the way it interferes with the way they operate. Impairment becomes contingent on the context not intrinsic to the child. That, of course, focuses on the environment. So the main difference is we go from focusing on the child to focusing, sorry, to focusing uh, on the environment, change the environment, not to change the child. By the way, I'm not saying I necessarily support this. I'm just ex explaining the big shift in the perspective that's happening. So if you do this model again, this nice little causal model, you go from the one where we we had the medical disorder model. We go to talk about atypical brains and attention rather than dysfunction. And we go to see impairment as environmentally context dependent. So of course what we do then is we're not focusing on where is the deficit in the brain, we're saying where is the issue with the environment. So what you're trying to do is identify ADHD positive environments rather than trying to change the brain. So what would that look like? What does an ADHD environment look like? Well I think about it as an arc of growth. So you go from feeling accepted as a, as a, as a, as a neurodivergent person to discovering your own hidden talents, to feeling valued, to developing agency and developing resilience, and then hopefully thriving. And that stands in sharp contrast to the, the environments most people with ADHD are faced. And I, it's a kind of arc of failure, going from stigma right the way through to vulnerability and failure. So the whole, the whole focus of the clinical work or intervention work changes with this shift in paradigm. So what you're trying to do is create these uh, environments. And what the science tries to do is, what are these environments? So, to get long story short, I got there in the end, is the digital world one of these ADHD positive environments? So on the face of it, you'd say, the way that, we, that people have to uh, uh, deploy their attention in the digital world has changed uh, what we do completely. It's quite clear to the extent that this sort of eye-catching, fragmented information, constantly changing, multiple uh, 
different locations, multiple tasks, actually requires a new sort of attention compared with what was considered attention in the past that actually drove the medical model probably. And could it be that this uh, attention is actually, this new attentional style that is effective in the digital world is actually uh, maps onto ADHD. So on the upside, we can see that this environment does cut with many of the characteristics of ADHD people. So that their openness to novelty, curiosity, their ability to monitor diffuse patterns within their environment, and this is all based on yeah, years of experimental laboratory research. The rapid ability to rapidly screen information, maybe not deeply, but rapidly. The short periods of intense hyperfocus, another characteristic of ADHD. And this engagement with multiple tasks at the same time. These are all kind of characteristics of ADHD. And you can see on the face of it, that's kind of what we're required to do in the, in the digital world. And crucially, in terms of acceptance, it allows, the digital world allows you to shape your own environment, you to choose your own environment. So this all looks very attractive from the point of view of somebody who's got ADHD. However, on the downside, uh, it's quite clear from the literature that while that's the case, um, clearly the digital world does complicate some of the underlying deficits, say, in working memory, say, in attentional control that people with ADHD have. It's undeniable. So if they have to do a task online rather than that, that requires more focused attention, actually the digital world is going to make that more difficult rather than less difficult. Crucially, it might make them more vulnerable, uh, ADHD, more vulnerable, some of the negative influences of the digital world. The big one is internet addiction. So people with ADHD are more prone to internet addiction and gaming addiction and stimulus-driven addictions, basically. And also, their curiosity may take them down paths that act at, at, at prematurely, in terms of age, that really are not healthy paths for people to go down um, in terms of information access. And of course, together, plus their exposure to social media, particularly cyberbullying, so people with ADHD more likely to be bullied online than other people, as they are, in the, as they are anyway, so it's not specific to digital. Um, this is probably going to have an impact on long-term mental health. So on the one hand, this is a kind of moral here, I suppose. On the face of it, it looks like this could be pretty, pretty attractive to ADHD, but there are lots of hidden dangers too. Now, getting back to the question, the pop science bit, and all these books about the goldfish, um, what, I can't remember what it was, but anyway, the attention span of a goldfish. I call it pop science, because really based on no evidence at all. But there are some interesting hypotheses. And I would say there's two hypotheses. One of them is called a phenocopy. I don't know if people know that. It's a concept from genetics, and it basically means a phenotype that mimics something else. So ADHD, this fragmented attentional style, which is kind of the way you operate on the... It kind of looks a bit like ADHD, but doesn't change anything fundamentally in the person. So that we don't become goldfish. We might behave like goldfish, but we don't become goldfish. And then secondly, there's the neuroplasticity, and this is where the, I guess the books are going to, that somehow extended engagement, chronic engagement with these sorts of experiences um, are gonna actually uh, change brain structure and function, which of course we know is very plastic, particularly during early development and early adolescence in fundamental ways. And as I said, there is no evidence. The evidence for the first one, kind of. Second one, I don't think there's any good evidence uh, for that yet. Um, but as a scientist, rather than writing these pop books, what we should be doing is going out and testing these hypotheses with data. Okay, thanks very much. I, I, I have to say, it's very hard to, to talk and not be distracted. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank, you. thank you very much.